What should we be doing about September 11th? I don't know how many times I get rebuttals to my articles on World Net Daily. All you do is complain. You never offer any solutions. Well, I have a whole series of articles on my website, harrybrown.org, that are what I that comprise what I think we should do about 9-11, what we should have done on September 12th, and what we could still do now. And I'm just going to run down the nitty-gritty of it with you very quickly. Step number one, permit guns on planes again. Not just arm the pilots, but quit the metal detecting screening that started in the mid-70s. Most people don't realize that anyone could have carried a gun on a plane any time before about September, uh, about uh, 1974, when the first hijacking occurred and they installed the metal uh, detectors. Before that time, I'm sure plenty of people had concealed weapons that they carried onto an airplane, and nobody knew about it. And I don't know of any... Uh, recorded incident of somebody shooting another passenger on a plane. But can you imagine that that 9-11 incident would have taken place if there had been any armed passengers on those flights? Even if the terrorists were armed, they still would not have known who on that flight might have been armed, and they probably wouldn't have even tried it. But if they did, the chances are very great that a number of them would have been shot before they could have taken over the controls of the plane. Second, recognize that what happened on September 11th was a trillion to one shot that couldn't possibly be duplicated, that every conceivable thing had to go right for the terrorists in order to make that come off the way that it did. There are so many things that could have gone individually another way and prevented any one of those four flights from ending as they did. Even if you then recognize that and didn't make any changes whatsoever, and a bunch of terrorists tried to do this a month later, they would not have been able to bring it off. The odds against doing it twice in a row would be too great, even if all the passengers and the pilots and everybody else on the second, uh, at the time of the second incident had no knowledge whatsoever of what had happened the first time. It was a trillion to one shot, and to reorder society over that is like banning all automobiles because some child got killed in an auto accident last week. I'm grateful to Andy Carpenter for bringing that to my attention. I hadn't even given any thought to that, but he's absolutely right. Step number three, hunt down Osama bin Laden, trying to create as little interference with foreign countries and their societies and their culture as possible while the hunt is going on. Find him, bring him back here, and put him on trial. And prosecute anyone who shoots bin Laden on sight, because it is very, very important that he have a fair trial in the United States of America. If he's killed without a trial, he becomes a martyr throughout the whole Muslim world. And we have added another 10, 20, 30, 40 million people who hate America and are absolutely sure America is behind every problem in the world. And if he doesn't get a fair trial, and he isn't really the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks, and no public evidence has been presented for that as yet, just a lot of talk, but if it turned out that he didn't get a fair trial, and he isn't the one who's behind it, then killing him means that the hunt for the real criminal, the real mastermind, would stop leaving that person on the loose to plot more attacks against the United States. So it is vital that he have a full, fair trial with an attorney and all the rules of evidence in, in uh, uh, all the rules of evidence present and that all those rules be followed to the letter. Step number four, declare an end to the so-called war on terrorism. Call it a victory, call it a defeat, whatever you want, but put an end to it and all the hysteria that surrounds it that is leading to all sorts of things, such as invading Iraq, uh, sending troops to the Philippines to fight rebels there who are not connected with 9-11 in any way whatsoever, not connected with al-Qaeda, not connected with any organized terrorism in the world, but simply disagree with the Philippine government. Long term, these things must be done. Number one, bring all the troops home from every one of those hundred countries where we have American troops around the world. Number two, do not tell other countries who their leaders must be or what their foreign policy must be. Stop meddling in the affairs of other countries. Number three, end all foreign aid, military or economic. Number four, don't support dictators or anyone in any foreign country. It's simply none of our business. And a few don'ts. Don't set up military tribunals. Military tribunals serve only one purpose in a just society, and that is to hold trials in areas where there are no civilian courts. That was the purpose of military tribunals, where out on the battlefield, somebody is captured, a spy. There is no ability to detain that person, and so you set up a tribunal, and if it finds that he's not guilty, then let him go, and if he's guilty, then punish him, if even shoot him, if that's what's supposed to be required. And, of course, military tribunals almost always find people guilty. All those that Lincoln set up during the Civil War, for instance, always found the defendants guilty. 
Don't hold people without letting them come to trial. Don't hold people in secret. Don't hold people and deny their access to a lawyer. Do not suspend habeas corpus, which is simply the right to apply a writ saying, I want to go to trial and get this over with. Uh, the right of habeas corpus is vital, and it is a vital part of Western civilization. It means that nobody can be detained indefinitely without having his day in court. And, of course, lastly, do not invade Iraq. With regard to Iraq, it's very interesting. Uh, a lot of things have happened this last week, and uh, it suddenly seems that the world isn't uh, looking kindly on President Bush's ideas of invading Iraq. And as a matter of fact, it's forced him to say that he's exploring other options now because suddenly there's all sorts of opposition coming from here, there, and everywhere else. And I'll mention a couple of the things I saw when we come back from the first break. But I do want to mention, too, that at the bottom of the hour, we will have a guest, Jim Babka of the American Liberty Foundation, who will be with us for the second half hour of the show, and talk to us about some exciting things that are happening at the American Liberty Foundation uh, to spread the, the uh, range of libertarian ideas in American society. There were some interesting developments about Iraq this past week, uh, with people coming out uh, very strongly. Uh, opposing the idea of invading Iraq and some other things, which I found curiously uh, welcome and optimistic. But I'm going to postpone talking about those until the start of the second hour because Joe from Palm Springs is on the line, and since we're going to have a guest at the bottom of the hour, I don't want to make Joe wait for 45 minutes before he gets on the air. So let's go right now direct to Palm Springs, California, and speak with Joe. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, Harry. It's great to talk to you. Thank you. I'm so glad you have a radio station there and can continue to hear the show. I had, didn't say anything. To, I, I don't think I said anything tonight about the, the Internet situation, but I'll just slip it in right now. And that is Radio America has advised me that they're making progress on finding a way to get us back on the Internet. So in case you drove 300 miles to be near a radio station so you could hear this broadcast tonight, maybe in a week or two or three you won't have to do that anymore. Now let's get down to business, Joe. What's on your mind tonight? Well, because of 9 well, one, one, there's been a shakeup of uh, the power hierarchy and a scramble to be or stay uh, king of the hill. And in this new atmosphere, I think the libertarians have a real chance of rising to the top because libertarian principles are the only salvation for, for mankind. Well, that may be, but that's been the case all along, and you could say the same thing about any previous crises. The problem is getting the exposure to let people know that that alternative exists, and that's not so easy. And, of course, it isn't just letting them know once. You've got to let them know several times so they realize there's some real substance here. Uh, I don't suppose you have any ideas about that, do you? Well, I think that we can secure great victories if we stress that each person has a natural or God-given right to be free to choose um, that uh, which they believe will make them happy. And we reject the Orwellian new uh great new world monitoring of what we put in our own bodies and let's draw a parallel um of the, the logic of alcohol prohibition and the drug war because alcohol prohibition created al capone sure and opium prohibition created the mafia and maybe uh, osama bin laden get some of his money from the, the opium uh, profits and kingpins in Colombia, which caused many murders and sure. uh, and, and, of course, there have always been street gangs of one kind or another, teenage gangs, uh, older gangs, and so on. But they were never so powerful and they were never so dangerous as they were until they began to be financed by illegal drug profits. And then suddenly they got lots of money. They can go around with Tommy guns and mow down their competitors, and little children get shot in the car crossfire. So uh, there's another creation that has come, out for, come about from prohibition. But I do come back to what I said before. These ideas have always been powerful if we could just get the proper exposure to them. And, of course, we also have to state those ideas in ways that people grasp immediately how much better their lives could be if these ideas were put into practice. Well, um, the, the, the wolves in uh, sheep's clothing in Washington brainwash people into believing a lie, and, and I think that their goal is to set up a brave new world where there's no families and only government genetically engineered test tube baby factories. <laughs> you where really think that's that's in the offing? They're going to monitor our blood and urine, and... and uh, it's going to be mandatory to take the prescription drugs, and um, and you know and, and the other uh, substances like like herbs and uh, natural foods will be outlawed. Uh, Harry, I'm well, that's, that's, that's certainly very possible. I wouldn't argue with that, Joe, whether that's six months away or six years away or whatever, but certainly uh, you're right that we are headed in that direction, we, and we never go in the other direction. I, I wondered if you had the answer to this question. You know, uh, they, they grow the opium poppies and the, the, the coca leaves. In, in the United States, we can get co cocaine, the processed uh, substance that does great harm, and, and the heroin, the processed uh, opium poppies, but we can't get opium or, or we can't get the coca leaves here. Uh, you know, okay, the, the, the so what's, what's the question? I'm, I'm at a loss. Um, 
that we can get the processed drugs here. Yeah, we get them from but, but from illegal get, dealers because they've been because all the legitimate companies have been prohibited from providing it. But we can't get the herbal products. We can't oh, I see the, what you're saying. We can't get natural organic cocaine. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, so that means the health food nuts uh, have to to uh, be satisfied with processed uh, cocaine, and who knows what preservatives have been put into it. Well, we're kidding about that, of course. But the fact is that because it's illegal, we don't know what's in it, and as a result, they are what were used to be in many cases very safe drugs are now very very dangerous drugs. Thanks for calling, Joe. We will be back right after this break. And as you know, I've been associated with the American Liberty Foundation since the beginning because I believe that this is a very worthwhile activity. Its central mission is to get libertarian ads on national television and also to do some other things to further the outreach of libertarian ideas through electronic means. And a lot of exciting things are going on in the American Liberty Foundation. So I now introduce Mr. Jim Babka. Good evening, Jim. Good evening, Gary. Glad to be here. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the foundation started out, uh, well, first of all, it took about a year and a half to get all the bugs worked out to get uh, so many things taken care of. But then finally, this last spring, you got ads on the air, and they've been running fairly steadily uh, since the spring on the gun issue, right? That is correct. Uh, we started in uh, February, and uh, they've been on as recently as uh, two weeks ago. Uh, they, we've had five million impressions, according to ratings so far. Well, that's great. And I should mention, too, that one of your policies is to produce ads that are on a single issue, specifically so that you can garner support, financial support, to get the ads on the air from people who support that issue but might not support other libertarian ideas like uh, ending the drug war or something of that sort. And that, that policy is going to continue, right? Yeah, we've, we've observed, if you look around town here, at some of the other organizations that are involved in doing uh, public policy work, that those organizations that try to be all things to all people tend to stay very small, and those, things that, those organizations that focus on one singular issue tend to grow very large. And there's some obvious reasons for that. Like, for example, there's less cause for disagreement uh, on policy and procedure and what, you're, what the organization is trying to do. Good point. Uh, we're going to try to duplicate that model uh, um, and still be uh, all things all libertarians anyway. Yeah, that you're is, getting the best of both worlds in, in what you're doing. Correct. And, and, you know, with the gun issue, we're good beginning. Uh, the heavy branding that we intended to do from the beginning, we're getting that in place now, and we will be having that in place on uh, each successive ad that we come up with. We're going to be moving the uh, gun ads to Armed and Secure as the brand name. It'll be the website. It'll be uh, uh, on everything that we do associated with the Second Amendment. And in, in those, as you talked about, we'll be focusing on the benefit. The benefit is that guns save lives and reduce crime, and that's the, the benefit that we'll drive home every time so we can start that dialogue with the American people. Terrific. Uh, and so in addition to the American Liberty Foundation website, which will, of course, always be there, that's AmericanLibertyFoundation.org, you, will have a, you are setting up a separate website, armedandsecure.org, which is devoted strictly to the gun issue and uh, provides support for what you're saying in the ads. Do I have that right? That is, that is completely accurate. And as I said, we're going to keep that partitioned off and focus with the people who are attracted to supporting that ad on helping empower them to be more effective at communicating on that issue. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so, so you're going to provide uh, tools to, to uh, help them communicate to their friends. Yeah, again, we're going to put the focus on electronic. We'll do some things print from time to time, and we already have, but uh, uh, we also want to do electronic tools. Uh, you already have made a wonderful CD that talks about the subject of government in general uh, that we've released, but we'll be having upcoming CDs uh, from you and, and, and maybe some other individuals that will be focusing on the benefits, again, of the Second Amendment, that guns save lives and reduce crime, and people will be able to conveniently listen to those in their car as they're going to and from work or elsewhere. They'll also be able to listen to them comfortably from their home, perhaps at their computer. Uh, that's good, and you uh, you don't have that CD yet, but uh, you you will have a booklet available soon, right? Yeah, we have a booklet available now. Actually, it's uh, uh, how to persuade your friends and family that guns save lives and reduce crime. And in one dramatic instance, we we've been giving these books uh, away to uh, individuals who've seen the ads for the first time, but they're also uh, for, available for sale in our brand new store, elibertytools.com. Uh, in one dramatic example, we had a, a young man call us who uh, had seen the ad. We sent the book to him. He loved the book, and uh, he read portions of the book to family members and friends after he got it. He was very enthusiastic about it. And the book is just filled with facts that uh, make the case that guns save lives and reduce crime. And uh, his mother, who had been opposed to gun use and uh, was scared of the fact that her son had purchased uh, uh, guns, uh, when she heard the data that was in that book, was so persuaded by it that she went out and purchased a handgun. And he called us back to tell us that. Well, that's great. Uh, the booklet is not very uh, hefty either, is it? What is it, about 25 pages? Uh, right now it's 42 pages. And, oh, right, 42. Uh, 42, and it's, a, it's a, um, with a lot of space in the margin, I guess you could say. And every week <laughs> we have... Uh, um, easy reading. Easy reading. And we, we took the time to back up the things that we were saying. It's fact-filled. Uh, it lays out an argument in a consistent order so that as you go through it, it makes sense that each, as you're going through, you start to build a natural objection. You say, well, wait a minute, you know, what if this was the case? Well, then, you know, you turn the page and there that question begins to get answered. And we just heavily footnoted the thing so it's very clear that we're not trying to make a rhetorical argument or say that this is just a good idea, but the facts are, are there. They're very clear. Uh, the presence of guns in your community reduces crime. You don't even have to own the guns to benefit from the fact that gun liberty exists. The fact that your neighbor may have the gun or that the passerby on the, on the street, uh, the law-abiding citizen who's carrying the gun in concealed fashion, uh, those people... They're protecting you. Correct. 
Right. Uh, I, I feel that's a very strong point that even if you don't like guns, even if guns make you nervous, it's important that people in your neighborhood own guns because then the criminal has to worry which of these houses has a gun in it. And he doesn't know that your house doesn't have a gun in it as long as guns are not illegal. And he knows then that somebody in this neighborhood probably does. And he's playing Russian roulette if he just barges into one of these houses. Uh, but I, I want to amplify on another thing you said because – what, what you've really done is to produce a, a booklet that's for the salesman of liberty, not so much for the prospect, to, to arm the salesman with what he needs. And everything you're doing is what I like, is benefit-oriented, meaning that we're talking to people in terms of how this will change their lives, not what it is that I want. I have a right to keep and bear arms. I have a right to this, and, and uh, the country's going to the dogs, and we need to save it before it does and so forth, but rather what the difference would be in your life if we pass this law or if we repeal this law. And that's what's really important to people, and that's what gets them interested. And then maybe after they're interested, they'll worry about what the Second Amendment says and these other things. Well, and I think it's a great point, Harry, and we're basically taking a page directly out of your book. And, and uh, you were a bit modest in your introduction of the foundation. Uh, you were a co-founder of this organization. And we want to follow the, the, the direction that you took in your presidential campaigns, and that is to put uh, the benefits of these issues out there. You know, the problem, the philosophy, uh, having the political philosophy and understanding your rights, all those things are important. There are some wonderful organizations out there already doing that work. But the contribution that we want to make is to focus on the benefits because we believe that's where the dialogue really begins. Uh, pounding the table and saying that this is your right isn't particularly persuasive. Uh, but explaining to somebody that right now, if we were to repeal the gun control laws, you would automatically become safer. There's an immediate benefit to it. In fact, we can go even one step simpler and say, you personally, without us changing a single law, uh, owning a gun uh, would be safer. Um, or your neighbors owning a gun would be safer. There's immediate benefit that we can demonstrate. Right. And that's the, the fact that these things, that changing these things and allowing people to uh, experience the benefits of liberty is an immediate benefit. It's a tangible benefit. It's something they can hold and they can see and they can understand, and it opens the door. And quite frankly, um, in having observed you for, for quite some time, I have found that it is a far more effective way to talk to people. Um, they're less likely to put up barriers or have arguments when a fact is in front of them, and they have to accept that fact. Well, it's also a case that they may well be interested in the morality behind it, the philosophy behind it, the right behind it, all of these things after they've taken an interest in the subject. But if you want them to take an interest in the subject, you are far more likely to awaken that interest by talking about something important in that person's personal life rather than some broad societal question. And then after they've taken an interest, then maybe you can talk about the underlying principles involved and how these principles apply to other issues as well. But you have to get their interest first, and that's the problem too often with people. And they say the American people don't want to hear this, so forth and so on. Well, you better ask yourself, how are you telling the American people that? And I like the way you're approaching it, obviously. Uh, let's move on, though. You're, you're now ready because of what you've accomplished with the gun issue so far, and you're not done there by any means, but because of what you've accomplished, you've got some new plans, right? That's correct. We're about to um, make a, our big first major expansion, and that means more TV ads. TV ads, as you mentioned in the introduction, is uh, uh, the, most, the biggest project we do. It's the, the central project. It's the real focus. I mean, everything that we're really about is electronic outreach, or what I like to call 21st century outreach. But uh, the key one, uh, key piece of that puzzle is the TV advertising. The TV advertising can reach people at the lowest cost per person, uh, far more efficient than printing up brochures or, or even handing out books that not everybody has uh, makes time to read. A lot of people go through that experience of giving a book to a friend and that book never getting read or a magazine. We print a lot of paper in, this, in, in our movement up to this point. We wanted to go out and do stuff on radio and television, and uh, the TV ads are just the, you know, kind of the, really the central focus. We want to go out and make uh, three new ads on three new topics. Uh, so, and we will allow our supporters to pick uh, those topics. They'll be able to vote. This is a, uh, a unique approach. We call it a market-based approach. They, every dollar is a vote. They'll be able to choose the issue of their choice. Uh, so if they want us to talk about the drug war, they want us to talk about income tax, they want us to talk about the loss of civil liberties, they want us to talk about the environment, whatever that issue is that they really want to see us talk about, we're going to invite them to come and vote early and vote often. As long as they don't vote for us talking about passing more laws. <laughs> Correct. Exactly right. Uh, that's great. It's a wonderful concept, and I guess you and Perry developed that concept, and it makes a great deal of sense. This is not a membership organization where we'll be spending our time trying to elect the new chairman this year and fighting among each other about this. Everybody can get his way just like in the free market. If you like Heinz mustard and somebody else likes French mustard, neither one of you has to go without what you want. You each can vote for what you want just by buying it, and you're providing the same kind of a service to people. If you want a drug ad and somebody else wants a, a civil liberties ad, uh, then you can each get it. Uh, just vote for it with your dollars. And we should, before we take this break, make sure that people understand that they can find out a lot more about this and to make a donation by going to AmericanLibertyFoundation.org and if for some reason or other you don't have Internet access in this uh, the 21st century, then there is a phone number, right, Jim? That's correct. It is area code 202-521-1200. That's 202-521-1200. Well, I probably should note that people may have noticed that I am not neutral on all this. I really think this is an exciting concept, and that's, of course, why I got involved. And before we go to the break, just let me say that the way I see it is that a few years down the road, 
what we want to see is somebody sitting on his couch watching the Saturday or Sunday football game, and at one of the timeouts, my heavens, there's an ad on the drug war about why we should get rid of it so that our children will be safer. Uh, and then somebody else is watching a Seinfeld rerun, and by heavens, at the commercial break, there's an ad telling them that American foreign policy is creating a, an unsafe situation for America, and here's how we can make America safer. And somebody else is watching MTV or Video One or whatever it may be, and right in the middle of that, they see an ad telling them that uh, the government ought to get out of health care so that you can have more expensive, more accessible health care. Jim, uh, why has the American Liberty Foundation uh, focused so much on television? What is the benefit of national television versus radio, local television, direct mail, uh, and so on? There's really two that I can think of right off the top of my head, and that is, first of all, uh, TV is a, what they call a warm or a hot medium. Uh, if a picture says a thousand words, a, a moving picture is going to say many more. And you have a, a chance within 30 seconds to not only just say what you want to in narration or to put words on a screen, but to actually make a visual impact on somebody, potentially a very emotional impact. We've done that with one of our ads called Intruder. That shows, Intruder, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very powerful ad. Yeah, and it shows a woman uh, who initially, uh, when someone's breaking into her house, uses, uh, begins to dial 911 but realizes that she doesn't have a lot of time and that uh, her safety is going to be up to her. And uh, we see in the ad that uh, as the intruder enters the room, she draws down uh, her pistol on him. And the ad makes the point, the narration makes the point, that there are 2 million acts of uh, criminal acts prevented each year by armed citizens. Well, you can make that statement in a radio ad, and you can make it in print, you can do it in a number of places, but having that, that woman go through those actions, having hearing the sounds as they're happening, all of those things coming together make radio a very high-impact medium. It, it's a 30-second ad, and I could give a one-hour speech about gun laws, and it wouldn't have nearly the impact that the 30 seconds has. And you can see that ad on the American Liberty Foundation uh, website. Unfortunately, it is not as good watching it on a computer, even the best computer, I believe, as it is watching it on a television screen uh, where it's brighter, where you see a much bigger picture than you can see on your computer screen, but you can get the idea of watching it on your computer. When someone sees something like this on national television, it doesn't mean that they believe it's right because it's on television or that it's true because they saw it on television, but they do tend to believe unconsciously that this is something that must have pretty widespread support that this isn't just some fanatic's idea. Look how many emails you get from people who have some big idea, and you don't know if this is some guy sitting in his garage who's half crazy. Uh, you might get something like that in the mail. You might even hear something like that on the radio, such as on Sunday night. But the, if you see it on television, you tend to think there must be a lot of people who believe this or it wouldn't be on national television. We're just about out of time, Jim. Those phone, the phone number again was 202-521-1200. The website is AmericanLibertyFoundation.org and Jim Babka is the guy that's making all this happen and I sure appreciate it, Jim. Thank you for having me on, Harry. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for being here. Earlier I talked about Iraq just in passing and talking about what we should do about the war on so-called war on terrorism. It's more a war on the American people and anybody who gets in the administration's way. And I mentioned that there were some interesting developments this past week. If you have been a regular listener to the show for some time, as I keep telling you you should be, then you would know that I mentioned more than once that the only reason Saddam Hussein could possibly have for using weapons of mass destruction, as they're called, against the United States would be if we invaded Iraq. Because if he were to just simply launch a, bi a biological or nuclear attack against the United States, he knows he would not destroy the United States and he would uh, face an instant retaliation, which would not be paratroops landing in the desert. It would be nuclear bombs on ba Baghdad and any place in Iraq that he might be hiding, and he would be dead. And obviously, it would be suicidal for him to attack the United States. So the point is that the only possible reason he could have for using those weapons against us would be if we invaded him, because he would then know that his days were numbered because he couldn't possibly resist an American attack that was determined to get him. And so if he's going down anyway, why not take as many Americans with him as he can and launch whatever capability he has against us? And I've been saying this for some time. I was amazed watching, I don't know whether it was CNN, M MSNBC, or CNBC this past uh, few days to see that Brent Socroft, who was a national security advisor to George Bush Sr. in his days, came out with a statement that was reprinted on the screen saying almost exactly the same thing, that the only reason Saddam Hussein would have to use such weapons against us would be if America invaded Iraq. So that's number one thing that was very encouraging. Here's another one that was encouraging. There's a woman named Ashley Banfield who is on MSNBC. She's a foreign correspondent. And she has been all around the world the past year, mainly in the Middle East and Central Asia, in Afghanistan and other places, reporting from all these different places around the world. And now she's back in the United States, and she's got some series on MSNBC where every night in the middle of uh, one of the shows, I don't know whose, uh, there's a segment with her in a different city interviewing people about how their lives have changed 
since 9-11, blah, blah, blah. You know, who wants to sit and listen to how somebody else has changed his life since 9-11? But anyway, that's what they're doing. And at the end of each segment, she, as so often happens on these shows, tells you the email she's been getting. They print the email on the screen as she reads it to you just in case you are visually impaired or something else. And I just happened to catch the end of one of these segments the other night, and there was the typical email saying the typical thing that you have heard so typically many times in the last six months to a year, and that is, they hate us for our freedoms and our liberty. And she read the whole email. There was more to it than that. But when she got done reading the email, she said, I have to interject here that in the past year I have been in the Middle East and Central Asia and I have talked to dozens and dozens and dozens of people and I have never heard anyone say that he hated America for our freedoms and our liberty. They hate us because of our foreign policy. Now that's a statement I never expected to hear from a regular reporter or commentator on national TV, but she said it. I never heard anyone say he hated us for our freedoms or our liberties. They hate us because of our foreign policy. Amen. Another hopeful sign, I believe this was last night, it may have been, or the night before, who was it had on his show, it might have been uh, Chris Matthews Hardball, or one of the others like him, had two guests on. And I didn't get the name of the first guest, but he was from some institute, uh, probably a neoconservative institute in Washington, uh, who was pushing that we must invade Saddam Hussein right now or we're in dire trouble. And the other guest... This was meant to be a bit of a debate. The other guest was Scott Ritter, who was the chief UN, pardon me, the chief U.S. arms inspector in Iraq. In other words, he was over there for many years after the 1991 war, searching for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Scott Ritter said it would be a horrible thing to invade Iraq, and he listed all the reasons that by now you must know as to why this would be a terrible thing to invade Iraq. For one thing, it would turn all of the Muslim com countries against us. It would turn half of Europe against us. It would turn at least half of the world against us if we were to, to allow our administration to do this. And he went on with other reasons. And he was there, and he mentioned something in passing which I didn't know. We hear over and over and over again that Saddam Hussein kicked the weapons inspectors out of Iraq in 1998 so that we don't know what's going on over there. And I thought that was the case, too, but it was perfectly understandable because no matter what Hussein did, no matter how he complied with this, that, or the other thing that the U.S. wanted, they still would not remove the sanctions, the blockade on food and medicines getting into Iraq. And when it became apparent that nothing Hussein could do would please the United States government, he decided, why am I putting up with all this when it's not going to change anything? And so he kicked them out. I was wrong about that, as I guess a lot of people were wrong about it, because Scott Ritter was the chief U.S. arms inspector there, and guess what he said in the middle of this conversation? Hussein didn't kick the inspectors out. Bill Clinton did. It was the U.S. government that removed the inspectors without any prodding from Hussein whatsoever. So when you hear somebody say that Hussein kicked the inspectors out because he didn't want them to find any weapons there, they're telling you something that's not true. Now, if somebody else had said this on television... I would have had to entertain the notion that he was misinformed about all this. But this wasn't somebody else. This was the chief arms inspector who was there. And if anyone in this world would know whether it was Hussein who kicked the inspectors out or our government who kicked the inspectors out, it would be the guy who was in charge of the inspection there. And that was Scott Ritter. And incidentally, every time the pro-war man raised some argument, Ritter just absolutely demolished him. And incidentally, too, it was a very civil debate, one where you actually got to hear what these people believed, the pro-war man and the anti-war man. And as a result, you got a chance to weigh their arguments and weigh their reasons for what they believed. But every time the pro-war man offered something that he thought was a telling argument, Ritter pointed out some facet of that thing that showed that what the man was saying really didn't make much sense at all. So it was a very interesting and enlightening thing. Another thing that I might mention is that my article on World Net Daily, I have a weekly article every Thursday on World Net Daily, which is uh, worldnetdaily.com, uh, I think the largest Internet publication, news publication. Uh, my article appears every Thursday. It also, if you subscribe to my Freedom Wire, or really the American Liberty Foundation's Liberty Wire, then you will get it automatically by email on Friday, and also by Friday every week the article is posted on my Internet site. Or usually, I wasn't there this past week, so it may, I may have not put it up before I left. Well, in fact, I know I didn't, so it'll be up later tonight. In any event, you can go to harrybrown.org and see any of these articles. The article went out on Thursday, and it made the case that Bush was inviting destruction by talking about invading Iraq. And I wound up by saying that either he is too much of a fool to recognize that an invasion of Iraq would trigger an attack on the U.S. with those weapons of mass destruction, if there really are any. And Scott Ritter is not convinced that there are any there. Or Mr. Bush is 
acting with callous disregard for the safety of the American people, meaning he does know what this would do in, in the event of uh, a U.S. invasion, the retaliation that Hussein would employ. And if he does know, then he's acting, Bush is acting with callous disregard for the safety of the American people, in which case he should be impeached. But in either case, he is unfit to be president. The reason I mention all this is because I got the usual round of emails from people, several dozen, complaining about the article. And what they said is very, very interesting. And almost unanimously, not completely, but almost unanimously, the argument that I got was, well, what should we do? Just wait for Saddam Hussein to attack us? Well, of course, my article dealt with that and said that there is no reason that he would have to attack us. The reason I bring this up is that we have to realize sometimes that when we are talking to people or writing to them or in giving them something to read or something to listen to, that they simply do not hear. They simply do not read. Now, I can well understand anybody writing to me and saying, I see your argument, but here's why I don't think it makes sense. I believe that he does have a motive, and this is uh, to attack us, even if we don't invade him, and here is how I see it. Here's why he would have a motive. Didn't get one email like that. Instead, I get the emails that say, well, what are we supposed to do? Wait for him to just drop nuclear bombs on us? As though I had never dealt with the question of whether he would ever do that. And it really is a funny thing how... Often, people just don't hear what you say. And last week, I posed the question of why is it that people keep responding to things that never get said? Why is it that people keep trying to put words in my mouth or the mouths of people that they oppose? And I gave three or four reasons that I thought might have something to do with it. And somebody called in and made the very important point, which I had ignored completely, that this is deliberate, that they are simply creating a straw man that's a lot easier to knock down than the arguments you've actually presented in making your case. So... That makes sense if they're talking about you to somebody else. But if they're talking to you, they can't use the straw man argument because you know that doesn't exist. That when they put words in your mouth, for instance, I gave the examples last week with regard to the so-called war on terrorism. And you notice I am now prefacing war on terrorism with so-called. For about 10 years, I've prefaced the phrase war on drugs with the word insane, the insane war on drugs, and I am now starting to preface the war on terrorism with the phrase so-called, because I'm really beginning to doubt that anybody in Washington is really concerned about terrorism rather than concerned about using this as a way to get more power both on the world stage and over the American people. But back to the point. I mentioned last week that people say things like, Harry Brown says that the terrorists really are not bad people, and if we would just be nice to them, they would be nice to us. And, of course, I've never said anything like that in my life. But if somebody says that to a third party, and the third party hasn't read the original material that I have written, then obviously he might think, well, I won't pay any attention to Harry Brown because he's got his head in the clouds or the sand, whichever direction you want to point him, or some other place where the sun doesn't shine. But nobody can come to me and say, well, I think you're wrong because the terrorists are not nice guys and your idea that if we just be nice to them, they'll be nice to us doesn't hold water because that person knows I don't believe that. But here are these people writing to me. Uh, the part about it I don't understand is why do they waste their time writing to me if they really are trying to make a point? You'd think that first they'd read the article and look for some weakness in it and then slam me on it, but they don't. It really is an interesting thing that... When this kind of hysteria gets created, people just get dizzy and start writing anything that comes to mind. And, of course, you know, I always get the emails that say, well, why don't you go live in Iraq if you think Hussein is such a good person? Or why don't you go live in Iraq if you like them better than you like us? And why do you hate America so much? And things of this sort. And that you begin to expect. And, of course, I'm using myself as an example, but I'm not trying to hold myself up as a martyr in all this. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm getting myself into. I'm not a sacrificial lamb. I'm doing what I think best, and I pity the people who act the way that I've been describing because they're obviously a little short on sense. But just because I'm using myself as an example does not mean I'm ignoring that the same thing happens to many, many other people. And when we come back, I'm going to give you a new approach to talking to people, one I hope you'll find useful. But first, let's go to Fort Myers, Florida, and say good evening to Jerry. Good evening, Jerry. Good evening, and I do appreciate your show. I was listening to the BBC after the speech the president made. and uh, Wait wait a second. When did he make a speech? Oh, of course he makes one every day. What what are you referring to? That speech, uh, I don't know, uh, was last week sometime. Oh, during the past week, and what was it about? Well, he was talking about all this, you know, stuff and why we had to be in the war and so forth, and all these things that he intended to do, and I didn't listen to the speech because I just, cannot listen to him. Anyway, the three gentlemen um, were discussing his speech. Two of them just 
said right out, he didn't say anything. He says, what, what was it all about? And they said it was just flat and didn't amount to anything and so forth. And the other uh, gentleman said, uh, he's like uh, the farmer that counted his chickens, and then when he went to sell them, there were no chickens. He said, that's uh, um, the way the president was. He's like the farmer who counts his chickens and then goes to sell the chickens, but there are no chickens? Yeah, he said that... uh, But he tells somebody there's so many chickens? Well, yeah, that's what he indicated, and then he said that that's the way Bush was. But anyway, uh, the people on the street for two days and two nights were uh, walking and demanding that uh, Blair uh, cut relations with the United States. That's the British people. Oh, really? These were uh, BBC commentators that said that Blair ought to cut cut off the dialogue with Bush? The people were demanding it. The people had signs, and they were marching for two days and two nights and just carrying on and demanding that uh, this uh, relationship be yeah. terminated. There have been a lot of public protests there, I know. You know, I've reported before about the Gallup polls, and, and you don't see very much about, well, let me say, first of all, you don't see really anything unless you really look for it about polls in foreign countries about American foreign policy. But you also, as far as I know, I have not seen a poll in some time now. It's been probably six months. But the last one I saw, Britain was about the only country in the Western world where a majority approved of what the U.S. was doing, and all the others, France, Germany, and all these other countries, they were overwhelmingly opposed to what the U.S. was doing. And I'm talking about the people, not the leaders who get bribed with American foreign aid. So well, now what you're indicating that the BBC commentators are saying is that even the people yeah. in Britain are beginning to turn against the United and, States. And not only that, I was listening to the Netherlands the same night, and they were had the same subject on. I listen to my shortwave every night to all these capitals. And they, they have English language broadcasts? Oh, yes, they're very good. I get more information about what's happening in the United States from the shortwave than I do from the paper series. But anyway, in, in the Netherlands, a man that was very hot, I mean, he was really indignant. He, says, he said it several things, but he wound up saying, he said, the United States is trying to conquer the whole world, and he said, we're not going to stand for it. This is somebody in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, a, co- a commentator or a politician or what? Do you think? I don't think he was. A co- I don't think he was um, a newsman. I think he was either something in business or the government. Very interesting. And then uh, tonight, just before I called, oh, go ahead. just before I started to listen to your show, I was listening to the Netherlands again, and they had a professor on from one of the universities over there, and they were discussing this whole thing. And he was saying almost the same thing that you did about uh, that. Uh, there's no point in the United States attacking. Uh, Iraq, because, you know, then the, what the, the results would be. And they had a long conversation, but I had a little trouble tonight on the, uh, you know, reception. But uh-huh. finally, he wound up saying, in the, the interviewer asked him, well, now, what do you think will happen here? What, what's going to happen? He said, the uh, Congress will impeach him. That's uh-huh. what he said. Well, be still my beating heart, but uh, I, uh, I, I doubt that that will happen, but I understand why he's saying it. You, you bring up... Uh, two very interesting points, one of which, I, when I was talking about Scott Ritter earlier, one of the points that he made was that there has been absolutely no hard evidence whatsoever presented by the administration that Iraq is a threat to the United States. And he made it very clear that he thinks Hussein is a horrible tyrant well, and, I'd and, like that that. The America, and that the Iraqi people would be better off without him, but that no hard evidence has been presented of any kind whatsoever that he is a threat to the United States. And, of course, there are all kinds of tyrants around the world, yeah. and it's not America's business to go and seat them. Well, well I'd like to ask you a question because I am really – puzzled about this, and you probably will know. How can, how can a president of the United States do all this and declare war without any attack on our country, because our Constitution says we sure. have to be attacked? How can he do that on his own? Isn't there some way that the Congress or the people can stop this? Well, you're, you're pointing out that it is an impeachable offense, but it is interesting that in the history of America's wars, only three times has Congress declared war. It did declare war in the first uh, World War One and World War Two. And I'm not sure what the other one was, but I believe it was the Mexican War. And I don't believe it did in the Spanish-American War. Certainly didn't, did not in the Korean War, the Gulf War, or the uh, Vietnam War, although in the Gulf War they passed a resolution, but they would uh, uh, deliberately would not declare war. And, of course, most importantly, they never declared war in the Civil War. Lincoln just simply raised the militia and invaded the South when Congress wasn't even in session and he wouldn't even call them back into session. So uh, it's, it's a precedent that's been established. And, of course, once you do that, then any president says, well, you know, they never did it before. Uh, why are you picking on me. But the fact is that we've got to start picking on the presidents. We've got to start uh, enforcing this at some point, and we've got to start uh, creating respect for the Constitution. The other point that you made that I, I want to uh, amplify when you said that you learn so much by listening to shortwave broadcasts, a great deal of what is happening on this war on terrorism, if you just want facts, if you just want information, if you just want knowledge of some kind about it that you're not getting on CNN and you're not getting in the daily newspaper where you live, comes from the newspapers that are on the Internet that are coming from England and other places around the world, like the U.K. Uh, uh, the UK Guardian. Uh, oh, gosh, what, uh, there's a big one over there. I, I can't think of it. But you do, if you uh, pay attention to WorldNet Daily, 
uh, they very often link uh, to articles from uh, overseas. Antiwar.com links to a lot of articles from overseas that present viewpoints and information that you don't get from the American uh, well, sites. Well, you see, the problem there is that I can't see, and I, I get to talking books on history and so forth, and I was born in Europe. I've had an education in European schools and all some of the American. And my father, prior to the World War I, was a station master in Belgrade when the Austrians were ruling over Hungary. I'm Hungarian. And uh, my father was in the, uh, after the war, they threw the Austrians out of our country and uh, my country there. And my father worked in the government for a while, but my mother was raised in America, and she wanted to, her father and mother came here in the 1890s, and uh, she was raised and educated in America, and then he took her back, you know, after, uh, just in time for the World War, and anyway, she wanted to come back to America. So I know quite a bit about the history of Europe. Well, I understand that you, uh, you're you not able to, to read those sites on the Internet, but, no. of course, the other people listening to the show, most all of them can, and mm-hmm. I want them to be aware yeah. of it. Uh, I, what, one last question to you, Jerry. Uh, what what kind of equipment do you have to pick this up? You just have a radio that has a short wave band? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you can get something like that at Radio Shack, right? Oh, well, I have my own. But, I mean, but I mean, uh, you're not talking about some kind of exotic equipment. You just go into a yeah, store yeah. that sells radios and ask for one that has a, a shortwave band. Am I correct? Uh-huh. Yes, I, uh, this one, uh, but it's a very good shortwave radio. I get I drive one in Japan every night, and I listen to all of this because I live alone, and I can't see, and this is a, and I get my books. I've gotten a lot of the talking books from the Oxford uh, uh, University in London. You know, they have uh-huh. a lot on history, and I only get history books and uh, biographies and uh, college books and things like that. Uh, that's I don't, terrific that you can do that. Yes, well, uh, I have learned a lot. And I tell, my real worry is what is happening to my country here. Of course. I uh, mean, I, I, I'm sorry to, to rush you, but we're going to have to take a break soon. I want to get some a uh, couple more answers from you. Uh, how did you uh, once you got the shortwave radio? How did you find these stations? Uh, just trial and error, going down the dial. Uh, well, yeah, you know, you have the thing or did you, did you get a guide then, somewhere? Well, no, I didn't. And my son also listened, and he helped me there. Uh, he, he set it all up for me from the different stations, and uh, they have, you know, the. Uh, different numbers, various numbers for him. He has it all set up for me. And Velcro, you have push buttons on the radio? Yes, and I, I, I use the Vel- Velcro for practically everything. I, I've got Velcro on certain knobs where the uh-huh. station's on. And since I've, uh, you know, I've learned a lot of things to do without being able to actually see it. Sure, that's, and, that's tremendous. Yes, and uh, so my big interest is in history. I've always, my brother's a history teacher also. And that, uh, to me, uh, and my father used to tell me so much about European history as I was growing up. And and I was well, it, it is fascinating. I, I I love history also, and I'm uh, as I mentioned before, I'm working on a book on war called The War Racket, which uh, covers America's wars from the Civil War to the War on Terrorism. Mm-hmm. And it is just uh, there are gaps in my knowledge that I have to fill, and so I've uh, uh, acquired in the past few months a whole lot of books that I need to go through to pick up certain uh, bits of knowledge. And of course, I just get lost in it. It's just uh, I get immersed in it because it's so fascinating to me to learn what has happened in the past and to realize that so much of what people think is unique today has happened over and over and over and over again in American history. Every war has started with an incident, like the World Trade Center bombing. And well, every I, war ended with some kind of knowledge about that incident that didn't exist at the time that the American people were whipped into a, into hysteria. Well, I have another interesting, if you have a little time here. My father, when we came to this country, worked for a company in Ohio. And uh, one day he went to work and all the men were standing outside and the sheriff was there. And he was putting padlocks on all the doors because the president of the company had absconded with all the money and left the state. And so the place was closed, it bankrupt and all that. And guess who the president of that company was? <laughs> Tell me. Um, Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush? Yeah. Uh, George, George Bush's grandfather? That's uncle? right. Grandfather, yeah, George That's W. Right. Bush's grandfather, George uh, H. W. Bush's father, That's and right. Prescott Bush was the was a senator from Connecticut. That's right. That's where he went there. So when you say that this has all happened before, there's a good example. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. And and of course, in the previous wars, uh, it was necessary to suspend civil liberties, and it was necessary to tell us about all the atrocities that uh, the foreigners were doing, which turned out to be half propaganda and, and half have an element of truth in them. And on and on it goes. And of course, we never returned to where we were before the war. Government always remains bigger as a result of what has been expanded during the war. Jerry, glad to hear from you again. Thank you so much for staying with us and calling in, and good luck to you. Thank you. And we have time to talk with one more person tonight, and that's Wes in Fort Myers, Florida. And Wes, I appreciate your hanging on, and we say good evening to you. Well, how are you tonight? I'm just fine. I don't think we've ever heard from you before, have we? No, you haven't. I didn't even know you were on until about uh, three weeks ago. And, oh. uh, and then uh, I was told uh, about your a uh, little dissertation about how people misread what you say. Uh-huh. And that had happened to me on the same radio station that Jerry listens to and talks to quite often. Oh, they're in Fort Myers. Yeah, they're in Fort Myers, yeah. I happened to ask, or 
you know, mention something that I wanted, uh, would like to hear. And my goodness, for a week <laughs> I, I was the talk of the town, oh, wow. the talk of Southwest Florida, really. <laughs> and, and and nobody listened to, and the talk show host didn't listen to me. And I, I told him two or three times, that's not what I said. I well, said I'd like to hear a debate. I didn't say I wanted to be in the debate. I wanted to hear a debate. Oh, you know, that's like uh, that Representative McKinney of Georgia who said uh, she thinks there ought to be an investigation to see whether anybody in the administration knew anything before 9-11. And the, the world came down on her, oh, this woman is accusing George Bush of knowing about the 9-11 the <laughs> attack in advance and so forth and so on. But that's the kind of thing it is. All she wanted was a, you know, an investigation to find out, and all you wanted was a debate. What was the subject you wanted the debate on? Uh, on the Holocaust. And I said, you know, I'd just like to hear a debate on it. And my goodness, uh, Ringo, I, I, I don't want to be the one debating, and I don't want to ask you a question because you've got your opinions and someone else has got theirs. I want to hear two different views cause, so I can ask both of them the same question. Well, that's a touchy subject. Well, I found know. Out. I found out. Yes, I did. Uh, I'll never breach that subject again. Uh, mm -hmm. That's for doggone sure. What's the next one you're going to broach? Uh, the next subject... You know, it all had to do with uh, going to war with Iraq, too. Uh -huh. and, and I just have said, you know, there is no reason why we should have been in the First World War or the Second World War or Korea or Vietnam or anything like that. By the way, I just, uh, one of the reasons I called, I wondered if you had ever heard of a, uh, a reverend by the name of uh, Stephen Crane. Oh, well, you're not talking about the one who wrote The Red Badge of Courage, are you? No, no, no. This man is, this is a modern person. Yeah, uh, fairly modern, yeah. Uh, I have some tapes of his someone gave me that uh, were made about 20 years ago. Yeah, no, I've never heard of him. Oh, boy, what a lot of information he gave. And one I'm, of, I'm almost afraid to ask yeah, what no, kind no, of no. information. No, but one of them, and you may know this, but since you're a history buff, I had come across it in my history reading but didn't realize that it was memoirs from Bismarck. But Bismarck had gone to a, um, a wedding of the Rothschilds back in 1850, and he heard them talking about their plans for starting a civil war in the United States. And they actually, at that time, the Rothschilds wanted the North to win or to lose. Uh -huh. They wanted to split the uh, country up, and, and one of the reasons for it was there, there were two major countries at that time that didn't have a central bank. One was the United States, and one was uh, Russia. And interestingly enough, it was Russia that came over and, and saved the North seaports and also went into San Francisco Bay and uh, stayed there for the duration of the war with, uh, you know, for Lincoln. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I remember uh, reading about that, but I have... I'm afraid forgotten about that Russian connection. And of course, it was it was during that same time that uh, Lincoln's Secretary of State Seward bought uh, Alaska from the Russians. Uh, right. So there was a lot going on with them. The the business, you know, I can see how you're mentioning we shouldn't have been in World War II would lead to a question about the Holocaust because it's often brought up. You don't think the United States should have been in World War II? Well, what about the Holocaust? Well, the fact of the matter is, the United States being in World War II didn't do one single thing to stop the Holocaust. <laughs> no, it certainly didn't. Did and it? so the point is. Uh, it, that doesn't make the Holocaust good. It just means that the United States didn't do anything to stop it. And, in fact, when Jewish people got on ships and tried to escape Germany and they came to the United States, Pretty President Roosevelt that. denied them special immigration visas in order to get into the United States. Oh, Wes, that music means we're all done.